Good morning, colleagues, postgraduate students. Uh, we are so happy to see you all here today. We have 260 people registered for this session, and we are really glad that so many of you could fi find the time to um, to join us for this very important uh, presentations. Uh, often a researcher come with a question, where do I find help with regards to some specific things? And today you are going to hear where you can find everything that is needed. So I'm not going to um, say too much, except for if you have any questions, will you please use uh, the, the Q&A box, not the chat box. The Q&A box, we will see your, your questions um, and you can just click on that and we will be able to help you and maybe answer everything that you would like to know. First of all, on our program today, we would like the Acting DVC Research and Innovation, Prof. Franz Wanders, to please do the welcome and background for this. Thank you, Prof. Franz. Thank you, uh, Janetta. It's Prof. Janetta, of course, uh, Duplessy of uh, Health Sciences. And she mentioned I'm the acting DVC, and I trust very soon we will have a more permanent person in this position, as we believe that the research innovation is very important to the university. We came through COVID-19 last year, uh, our publications look fine, but our PhD and master's students uh, could not make it all. We are sorry about that, but we are trying our utmost best to help them. And this is then one of the reasons for uh, this research innovation forum, where we want to splash to help to ensure that not only staff, but students, those that intend to do postgraduate studies, those that are already busy, to help them as much as possible. Thus, you will see on today's agenda, we have all the aspects of the research and innovation being done at the Northwest University. And I trust that with the support office, we will ensure that we will have a better flow communication and as I have already mentioned I've got an open door policy if there are problems to ask Prof Nanesi who is the director of the research support uh, Dr Jeanine Jansen for the technology transfer innovation to Shernice Subramani for any of the international students, they are also important. They had difficulties last year, but I trust it will improve from today as we go on. Thus, I want to wish each and everyone all the best. I wish all the presenters success, and I trust that this will help to embrace our research and innovation to even higher levels. And I want to thank also our VC, Prof. Dan, who will do the uh, vote of thanks for the opportunity that we can do our research at the university. Without a good structure, with a good support, it would not be possible. Thus, all the best for this session today and those that are following, because we are not leaving you alone, we are going to continue with the support. With these few words, uh, Prof. Janetta, it's back to you, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Franz, for the welcome and background. Uh, now I'll call upon uh, Prof. Nenesi, who is going to speak on the NW research landscape and the implications of holistic research and innovation support. Over to you, Prof. Nenesi. Uh, thank you, Prof. Juju. And um, 
Ladies and gentlemen, um, I am honored to be presenting to you today um, during this uh, occasion. So I am going to share my screen now. Okay, thank you. I suppose everybody can see the screen. Um, Please put it in presentation uh, mode. Yes. Okay, can you see it in presentation mode? Okay. All right, thank you so much, colleagues. I am going to uh, just give a summary of the research landscape uh, at the NWU and its implications on holistic research and innovation support. So um, I am going to try to really uh, uh, save time and, and rush through quickly. So uh, you, you can keep typing if you have comments or questions as, as the program directors uh, have indicated. Now in my background will just be where I explained to you the RNI implementing structures at the Northwest University. And then uh, the research home collaborations, research output and support received from the NWU. Those are the, the topics that we extracted from the survey that we conducted uh, um, with, with most of you colleagues. And then I will then uh, tell you about the research support department and its role. Um, so research is, is uh, um, conducted mainly in, in, in the faculties, but through uh, several uh, uh, different levels of, of entities like centers of excellence research units. Uh, but we also have uh, entities that are either a commercial research entity or it's a hosted entity or platform. Uh, for example, the ones that are shared maybe between a government department like Department of Science and Innovation and, and the university. And then we have colleagues who are not, who do not belong to any research entity, but they are still researchers and they are in our, our faculties. And so different faculties have different ways of attending to those, but mainly uh, those colleagues are, are doing research within their schools. So uh, how do we support you? The NWU has several structures. Of course, because our department is called research support, then one might think that we are actually supporting you with, with all, all, all things. But basically, no, we are actually strengthened by, 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 by so many support uh, departments, uh, including technology transfer and innovation support that Prof. France has mentioned. We, we, we have library and information services. So these are, depart uh, uh, depart there are departments that are not within the RNI uh, a portfolio but they are very important in supporting the research and innovation agenda of the Northwest University. So um, now the survey that we conducted last year, initially we had uh, more than 700 uh, colleagues that had registered to participate. Um, unfortunately, at the end, we could only use uh, uh, the responses of uh, around 150 uh, responses. Uh, those are the ones that were valid as some of the people actually also ended up not participating at all. So the question that we asked ourselves first is about the research home. Be where are the people? Because I have shown you the structures. Where do we think a research is being conducted. But it is always better to try and understand from the researcher uh, where their home is. And uh, so we asked the researchers questions like, which research, in which research program do you belong? And we had the, the, the people who are conducting their research within researchers, within hosted entities. So in, in a nutshell, of course, we picked up that people are doing research within entities 
and there are still those who are not uh, uh, who are conducting research, but they are not within entities. But what was important for us also was to understand where do they belong also outside the Northwest University, and hence the question: Are you involved with a research? Uh, a, association or scientific association and uh, of course it is clear that most of our researchers belong to national research or scientific associations and of course a plus is that we have about 37 percent that are serving in editorial boards which shows actually the quality and the reputation of, of our researchers in the institution. So now what are the implications of belonging uh, or, or having a research home within the NWU and also within the national associations? One is because when he, uh, uh, we, we have a researcher that is more or less a lone ranger, that there's a problem of, of how you support uh, uh, the colleague. So hence we're saying, uh, then we have limited support. Uh, but of course, there are faculties that make sure that those that are not in entities are supported either through the Office of the Deputy Dean Research and Innovation. But it is very important that we conduct our research within some form of structure or program. The issue of workload also because now it, it becomes difficult for the faculty to really account for your research uh, uh, time if you are uh, not uh, within the, st the structures that can be accountable for the research output. So I also copied a few. We had um, also the, 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 the qualitative uh, um, responses and uh, we, we had, uh, issues around workload that were raised, including the, 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 the issue of getting somebody to assist with admin work so that the researchers can focus on the research. And then uh, one other uh, uh, concern, uh, uh, Prof. Franz, if, if, if I may <laughs> call you by name in this case, is the support for our research chairs so that they can uh, get their chairs upgraded. Because as we know, for the, the NRF, the Sachi chairs, tier two chair uh, 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 gets uh, uh, two, two cycles. And at the end of the second cycle, they must have actually been attained a, a, a tier one stage or they will lose their chair. So it's very important that we look into that part and support our research chairs. Otherwise, we still have uh, uh, the, the call, the, the, the suggestion by staff members that we should review the workload for junior staff. Others are saying in their department, the, the, the workload issue is not uh, um, addressed according to, to the levels or, or the ranks. So uh, maybe that is uh, something to be noted also by the deans and the deputy deans to attend to, to the matter. You will, of course, get other comments um, in the in the presentation uh, slides that will be shared with you after this. Right. So the other thing we needed to to understand whether our our researchers are participating, are collaborating with 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 others. Like I said, it's not easy when when you are like alone trying to conduct research. So we asked a question whether the colleagues are involved in collaborative research. And um, and also we we wanted to find out the the, the type of, of collaboration or the setting. Hence we have 30% who are just uh, uh, within collaborating across faculties, others are collaborating within and across, and then we have uh, colleagues uh, collaborating with national and international partners. So it is very important for us that we encourage this because collaboration, especially with national and international partners, will give a platform for our researchers to be visible and at the end to also improve even the rankings of the university. We also asked a question about the university collaborations and the universities uh, uh, listed here, the national ones, it's, it's very interesting 
to see that our our researchers collaborate more with with the top uh, 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 with the top five. Uh, like you see, we ha we have uh, University of Johannesburg, University of Pretoria, uh, UKZN, uh, uh, Stellenbosch. Those are the ones that we are having more uh, research collaborations with. And on international level, we have these. Uh, universities, but we have the uh, uh, Leuven University, which, um, uh, well, well, because of the, the 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 amount of or the number of respondents we had, we also uh, uh, looked into our our insights, our system that works with a web web of science. So we extracted information there about the Northwest University and tried to contrast to compare with what we are getting. And we are of course getting uh, that even uh, the, on the web of science platform, it is clear that uh, at, at international level, university, uh, Northwest University researchers are collaborating more with, with KU Leuven. And of course the top ones that are mentioned from the survey are still the top ones that are picked up through the web of science. Right, and then of course, uh, we also compared our collaboration, international collaborations with national bench uh, 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 averages and global averages. So we are well above the global average uh, with, with our collaborations. The, the, the green line is the Northwest University, but we are below the national uh, average. So that is also something that we need to, to look into. Of course, here is just the collaborations uh, by country and, and research area. And this is the data that is uh, spanning from 2016 until uh, 2020 in this case. Okay, so what are the implications of, of the, the, the collaborations, be it national or international? The, the implications are first on intellectual property. So uh, you will see that when you, we will at some point need to interact with TTIS, we will need to interact with global engagement, uh, open access issues, and, and the platforms, we will need to interact with the library, IT comes to play, and of course, research support now also needs to come on board and help our researchers with project development and managing their project. As you had seen that the complaint is also around the admin workload. Of course, then if, if we, we do project development with you and help you to have a reporting plan and all those, then that will also minimize the admin work. Of course, we picked up a few uh, uh, um, suggestions and, 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 and concerns on the matter, but we, we can see that people still uh, uh, need the, the writing retreats. They, they still need to be trained on some aspects. Uh, people need uh, to be assisted in setting up collaboration agreements with industry partners and um, the project management support is coming up again and uh, the access, the issue of access, which I think um, Dr. Moyo will, will, will touch on. So we also looked at the research output and we tried to understand the type of research output, the frequency of producing research output from our researchers. So um, in a nutshell from the web of science, we are able to see the, 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 the fields that are most popular for, for publishing by the NWU uh, uh, researchers. Um, and uh, we are able to see that the, the number of publications uh, the web of science publications have been increasing in the in uh, in the Northwest University, but we have a concern here with the decline uh, uh, when when it comes to to citations. So it it means that even though we are increasing the number of publications, we we do not get enough cita citations. That could then take us back to the types of collaborations that we engage in and the outputs from the, those collaborations. And this is the point where now we have to bring in the M and D students, because if we do our supervision 
right and we make sure that we engage we involve our our mnds in our publications it means we are actually widening the, the dissemination pool because this will then go out and interact with others and then we can be able to be cited so what are the implications um, one here is the research integrity and also the funding because with research outputs is a, a, there's the issue of you need to give the researchers a start so that then they can start generating uh, a area and they can sustain their, their research work. Of course, integrity is important because now when you bring in students, you also need to make sure that um, you, you, you observe their, their copy uh, uh, right also. Okay, so now we ask people also about the type of support that they can say they have received from the Northwest University. And uh, people have indicated uh, 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 that, okay, we, we, we receive a lot, uh, uh, some support. I will get that to, to the comments. Somebody said we receive some support but we are having issues in this one. So that's why I'm uh, putting this slide first to show there are people who have indicated what they would like to be trained on. And then we also ask people in their opinion, what do they think uh, are the factors influencing their research productivity? And uh, some people just said they are, it's self-motivation. They are just motivated to do that. Others, it's, it's uh, 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 because of, of, of the, the, the mentoring that they are receiving. So that now and then I will keep going to, to the supervisors to say, uh, let us keep doing this, this work. Let us not just supervise the work, let us mentor uh, uh, our, our MND so that they become seasoned researchers. So there are people who actually uh, believe that they are productive because they got sponsorship. Or, or the, because they know that they are going to be promoted to, to higher ranks. So uh, that, is, that is the part that we picked up. So we also uh, now asked people to propose interventions and basically uh, there's the, the training and the, the research networks. Uh, people need to, to, to be supported in these informal research networks. And um, of course, uh, we, we have also been making attempts to do that. And that in, uh, includes now that we, uh, we got NWU to be registered as a, a, a white row member institution, white row the World Association of uh, Innovation Industry, Research and Technological Organizations. And from this year onwards, the NWU is now actually the research focal point uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa in, in the way through. So that means that we, we, we have actually now a, a better footing and, and we, we receive more audience on, on that global platform to be able to form networks that link to, to industry. Of course, uh, there are also some uh, concerns uh, about this and this relate to funding and the uh, colleagues uh, are still uh, happy with, with, with the bonus and the area system. Uh, that's something to note, but there's that call to increase fund, uh, funds allocation to departments. Uh, I think that one is, is for the faculties to look at. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will have to to rush now into um, trying to, to wrap up the research landscape. Now, we, we, we have seen that the majority of researchers at the NWU belong to research entities, and there are a few that do not belong to entities, but those still have to be supported, which means faculties have to work out a way of supporting uh, uh, those, those researchers. What else have we observed? The NWU is doing well when it comes to a participation in research and scientific associations at national and international level. Uh, however, 
we need to address uh, um, the matters that, that were raised, including uh, the, the, the support to, to, to participate in the network. So it could be that those who are, entity, who are in entities have better support to be participants in networks because they engaged in more of the uh, uh, research team or research collaboration and consortia co as compared to the colleagues who are who are uh, doing research outside the entities. Now, uh, like I said, the supporting structures at the NWU uh, include research support. And so I am going to just briefly um, uh, talk about the research support department. Um, for this year, 2021, our strategic statement is actually to create an enabling environment for quality research at the Northwest University. We, we plan to excel in, in providing support to develop uh, the researchers' research capacity. That includes the MNDs. We, we are working on streamlining and standardizing research support processes to improve the quality of research. And one of those initiatives that we are trying to do to streamline this is this research and innovation forum, where we can all sit together and now uh, uh, look into what do we have, uh, what is the library doing, what is IT doing, what is community uh, impact doing, and how can we pull resources together and support our researchers. So our seven programs is research development, management of research funds, projects and research information. Uh, we also have research ethics and integrity, management of research outputs, uh, quality improvement of research. And for, uh, for this year, we added the higher degrees academic support following the doctoral review that we had last year and the improvement plan that the Northwest University has submitted to the Council on Higher Education. Right, so the research development, of course, I, I put a, a colleague's pictures and their phone numbers there um, so that uh, you can be, you can know who to contact and for what type of support. So. This is where you will get uh, support relating to your trainings, to, to all capacity related programs, including uh, postdoctoral fellowships. And uh, we, we also uh, facilitating the DST NRF internship program. Uh, of course, this year we didn't get a new uh, intake because of we, we all know the, the, the economy and, and the COVID issues. Uh, but these are uh, the programs and, and the types of support that you will get uh, from, from, from our department. And then under management of research funds, we, it, it is a very big program, therefore we divide it into, into two programs, the pre-award management. So these are the colleagues who will start by communicating the, the opportunities to you and, and helping you to make sure that at the end your application is in the system and it is signed off and it has reached the, 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 the potential funder. So all the pre-award processes are handled by, by, by the two colleagues and then Post award immediately after you get your your the letter that is saying you are successful, uh, maybe with your uh, application for a bursary or for a some type of research grant. Then we we start now to uh, support you through the post award management program. And uh, we have of of course three colleagues. Uh, Heide Rudels, I don't have a. Uh, a picture here. Uh, so, of course, they are, they, 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 the process starts when you sign the condition of grant, when you start to, to be able to uh, uh, spend your funds. These are the colleagues who will now tell you that your report is due or you are not spending the funds by the time that you are supposed to. So all those communications happen in the post award management and also preparations for audits happen in, in this program. 
And then uh, we have projects and information management program. This is also a relatively new program, but we have actually implemented it successfully throughout 2020. And we, we keep growing and improving. And these are the colleagues who are helping us a lot now with the big international and uh, consortia research, uh, uh, consortia proposals, who are helping you with project development. All you need to do is to indicate on time your intention to apply for, for uh, uh, this big grant and then indicate the type of support you need from them. They will even help you with doing the budget and uh, preparing your timelines and your team that you need on board. But you need to give your technical uh, content on time so that uh, they can be able to meet the deadline. Of course, we have a very important program, the Research Ethics and Integrity, which uh, um, is, is impacting on everybody's research. I mean, we, we cannot uh, shy away from research ethics uh, when, when we do research at any level. So um, Bosinati is the one who, who is actually helping us with that online uh, research ethics application system and also uh, uh, playing an important role as a resource person for the research data and research data gatekeeping uh, committee. Right, and then we have the, our research outputs uh, information management, and that is uh, uh, Ms. Teresa. My apologies for, for that. Uh, so Ms. Teresa is the one who's helping us to make sure that at the end, we submit our subsidy claim to DHET, Actually, we get first our, our uh, submissions to be audited before we submit to, to DHEAD. So she's the one who's even training, uh, if faculties you need uh, a training for your admin uh, staff to be able to capture your outputs. So uh, Ms. Teresa is, is the one. Of course, there's quality improvement of research, which happens in, in the office of the director. And that is where we, for now, we are coordinating the doctoral review improvement plan. Last year, we were uh, coordinating the doctoral review itself. And then annually, we do the review of um, research and the internal evaluation of research entities and, and review of, of policies and, and, and guidelines. Right, and yes, this is our new program, the Higher Degree Academic Support. Uh, which is now we we just our we were just establishing this function, but we will um, in a few months' time we will be having a higher degrees academic support hub, a virtual one where a higher degree student can just log in and find all the information, the link to the admin, the higher degree uh, uh, administration, the link to the higher degrees manual, and, and all the information. Uh, they should just within that hub get to the ethics uh, applications or be able to, to sign their agreements with, with the supervisors in that same uh, support hub. So. Um, before I close, let me also emphasize that we are uh, collaborating a lot with the, the faculty teaching and, and, and learning support within CTL, uh, headed by, by Prof. Manuel. And this is to make sure that we, we, we work together to support postgraduate students within the institution. So I did not do a lot uh, I did not give a, a lot of information on higher degrees because we are going to launch the postgraduate program together with FTL from CTL. And that is where we will now give more information. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Nenesi, for making us aware of the support structures, the research home limited research time, research output, as well as the research support department. So I'm going to quickly rush to the question and answer chat box there and check a few comments which have been put and maybe you can be at the end to address those Prof. Nenesi. 
the first one, MP, don't think I'm running away from you. Yours seem to be more of information giving uh, 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 sections, then I'll come to them last. The first one, Prof. Nenes, is from A. It says, I can hardly believe these citation figures. Is this total citations or citations to papers from that year? So maybe Prof. Nenes, if you can respond to that. Yes, okay. Uh, firstly, uh, Prof. Haynes, we, we, we extracted information that is only on the web of science. So it means it is citation, citations of those papers in the web of science. And secondly, we are using information that is averaged from 2016 up to 2020. So which means it, uh, uh, basically what we are saying, the decline in the citations is not the decline in the citations for all the research outputs at the Northwest University. It is only the decline in the citations of the research uh, outputs that are on the web of science. And um, what other considerations should we make? Yes, we should also consider the fact that it is being averaged for, uh, uh, over those years. Okay, thanks, Prof. Nenesi. Then the next one is from Rowan. I think that RNI should be based in grant writing, uh, sorry, in grant writing retreats and training to especially secure large funding from international sources. Our research support offices, office is not currently in the position to support such funding applications. For example, NIH. These types of uh, grant writing take a minimum of three months to get to a competitive level with an intensive workload to develop proper budgets and engage with resourceful stakeholders. With large administrative load of these grants, it will also help to expand the support in the NW research office with expert experience in international funding administration. I think this is more of a comment. Let's move on. Increase in publication numbers, that is from Marianne. Uh, numbers, oh, sorry, they are keeping on coming now, but decrease in citations could indicate issues in one, publication fees. Most researchers cannot pay for the open access options at journals. Two, motivated to publish quantity instead of quality. So many publications, but in low impact, poorly cited journals. Could anyone comment on these points and how these are approached? Prof. Nenesi, if you can start on that one. Yes, uh, thank you, Prof. Dudu. Oh, and and uh, Marianne, yes, this is, this is correct. Um, we also think that the fact that we cannot afford um, open access publish, but remember, uh, funding for, for publishing does not reside uh, with us, it, it, those are the matters that are at, at faculty level. And uh, last year, we, we tried to, to draft the guidelines for, for uh, uh, publishing fees at the Northwest University. And we also had that clause where we were saying the library should budget for open access. And that's why now we have not taken those guidelines back to Senate because looking at it, then we felt that, but can we afford that? Can the institution afford that to actually give the library such a big budget to subsidize uh, open accessing of articles? So this is still a matter which is uh, uh, um, uh, on the table and we have been working with the library uh, to develop the open access policy, which I think Dr. Moyo will, will attend to in, in his presentation. But yes, of course, the publishing fees play an important uh, uh, role and the pressure to publish also plays an important role. Uh, thank you, Prof. Nemesi. Uh, the next comment is, Please, could you provide more detail on the type of support provided under research development planning? And that is from Ross. Yes. Okay. Uh, we currently, now we have been, um, just because that is a program that we just started last year, what we did, we started by asking faculties to participate like in a survey for, uh, uh, we said, ethics and supervision training 
and we were saying if we are to plan for development, for research development, we need to understand the people's needs. So what do you develop if you do not know what you are developing? So we already did that and we, we submitted the report uh, from that uh, uh, survey, I think the end of the year last year to ESCRI. And now what we are doing, we have developed a research uh, skills and training register. And the, currently two faculties has been approached to pilot that, that is a faculty of theology and, and FNAS. So those two uh, faculties will pilot the training register, which we are doing online uh, uh, using InfoEdge platform. And then that will help us to plan properly. Like you see, there's a comment that uh, Prof. Dudu read about uh, the, research, the grant writing and, and all those. So those are the things that we also pick up uh, through the surveys that we have been doing in the research planning uh, uh, sub program, because then we are able to even uh, uh, inform our, our planning with the university capacity development uh, program, the UCDP. And that is why this year for the first time we have a, a budget for doing grant writing workshops. Thank you. Thank you. Then from Frank Weiss, uh, please, yes, please. It would be help, very helpful to have the information presented here today in a document. I think that's yes. food for thought, Prof. Nenesi. Yeah, but, but we, we have, we have circulated actually the research development, uh, the research support plan to, to the Research and Innovation Support Committee and deputies are part of that committee. The, the, the issue was for the, now for each faculty to disseminate so that people can have, disseminate the information and everybody in the faculty can know what we are offering to them. Thanks, Prof. Nenesi. Then Richard asks, how does one establish citation rates given that publications are increasing? Of course, it, it, it has to be through the, the, uh, uh, the, these platforms like the Web of Science and, and uh, the, the Scopus and, and, and all these. That, that is how, and, and of course, there's always a formula. Like there are in certain fields where people are saying it takes three years for citations to build up. And, and in other fields, they can, they can be published this year and already be cited in the same year. So considerations that are taken when, when coming up with factors to determine the citation rate, the considerations include uh, the field of, uh, um, of, of specialization. And then uh, Ayn says, but does, does, but does this refer to NW papers that came out that year? I the, think of the, the statistics citation. which you presented, yes. Okay, for 2020, 2021 is not included. Yes, remember when the, the on, on the web of science, on, 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 on insights, they will indicate that the calculations maybe start from 2006, then they had traced that and come up with a citation rate for this particular a, a, a citation. And that is why for now, when I am saying 2016 to 2020, uh, it, it could be that the paper that came out in 2020 has not yet been cited even now. It could be that by 2016, the figures that of citations 2016 were for the papers that were published already three years before 2016. So that is why I'm saying it's all about the formula and explaining that formula. And in this case, our formula is, it is averaged for the, what was cited from 2016 to 2020. It doesn't mean it, the one that was cited in 2016 was published in 2016. It could have been published before. Thanks, Prof. Nenesi. Then Chris to the problem with sound. I think it's sorted now. I see it's written and on. Then the next question is who to conduct to get access to info aid? Uh, that's Miss Teresa Smith. 
Thank you. Then should publications with more authors, for example, from international institutions, get more credit with respect to author equivalence, the letter encourages a single author publications. Hmm. That's what is, is a matter to be debated at national level, or, uh, because I mean, that now impacts on, on how, how the, the, the article equivalence uh, are, are done and shared and the, the, the weightings, the sharing of, of the weightings uh, between the authors. I mean, for quality purposes and, and for, for having better exposure, I would say publish with more authors. But then the issue is uh, other people are only motivated to publish based on the, 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 the funds that they get for subsidy. And that now also uh, is now contradicting the fact that you need to publish with more people. I mean, for me, I believe if I publish with more people, then I will be cited more, but then I will not be getting um, area <laughs> from, from uh, our institution because it's only a small portion that will come out. And then Prof. Menesi, Philip asks, how come we have researchers who do not belong to research entities? I do not know, in short. That is uh, an issue that should be discussed in faculties. Then Tseho Fatso says, is it possible to provide us with the link for presentation recording as I'm experiencing network problems? Yes, the, the, this is going to be available also on YouTube and the link will be sent to everybody. Okay, for the sake of time, colleagues, as we are also against time and we have a, a program, I'm going to just quickly read through and paste uh, comments which are very important there. Good morning, colleagues. Please take note of this opportunity currently available that is advancing of higher degree qualifications for funding made available in support of the completion of master's and doctoral degrees of NW staff members. Target group is full-time permanently employed or fixed term appointments with benefits registered for a first, uh, is it first master's or doctoral degree who has not received this previously for the same degree or level and with the intention to submit for examination in 2021. Funds are typically used for replacement staff, course for printing, binding, language editing, technical statistical support, your conducting pay and the email addresses there. And then the second one also available under UCD enhancement of research profiles Academic Mentorship Development Program. We also have an external research consultation on board, ready, ready to assist or advise on readiness or getting ready for an NRF rating application. Welcome to conduct us to arrange a one-on-one -on -one consultation with you. The second one is mobility grants offered to researchers aiming, or is it researchers? aiming towards bringing an NRF rating application in the, next, in the near future. Funds are also typically used for travel cost or replacement of staff. And then the last one from pay is capacity development research related workshops planned for the year. There is a research integrity training webinar, ethics training webinar, grant proposal writing workshops offered by UCT RDA, postgraduate supervision, Strengthening postgraduate supervision webinars in collaboration with Rhodes University, article writing, virtual retreats, and then the names are there. Introduction to research article writing, how to conceptualize and plan a paper for publication and preparing a research article and making it ready for submission to an accredited research journal of choice. This should be sent out in time and you're also welcome to conduct in there. So based on our time, we we'll move on to the next program, colleagues. Uh, I thank you. Um, colleagues, I see that Tsikhufatsu um, uh, asked the question that New Sound Productions would like to answer. Will you do that now, please? Prof. Uh, they have posted the response on the chat. 
Okay, <laughs> sorry, I did I did not see that. Okay, so um, then I would like to to say something about the question that Prof. Richard Haynes asked about the article equivalence and our international uh, collaborations, and that is something that I learned through the years is that you associate with the best possible. So I never gave up on my international collaborations, and I would strongly support any researcher who does that, even if there's uh, less um, article equivalence earned by doing that, because that increases your um, uh, citation rate tremendously, because if you associate with the best in the world, they are being searched by name, and then your name will also come up um, on uh, when, when they search. So that could be uh, a way to increase your citations. Then we have to move on. Um, and we want to listen to Dr. Matthew Moyo from the Library and Information Services. When I was a young master student, the library was my second favorite place to be. The first one was my laboratory, of course, being a natural scientist. Um, so these days you don't even have to go physically to the, to the library um, to access the library, but Dr. Matthew is going to tell us all about that. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Duplessis. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. You can continue. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, um, all protocols observed. Um, thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, for putting um, this event together for us. We are excited to be part of it. Um, as has been indicated uh, by the program director, my name is Matthew Moyo, and I'm from the Library and Information Services. And I'm going to be speaking to you about um, the LIS, LIS representing Library and Information Service Research and Open Scholarship Services. And um, this is how I would want to start, that uh, the increase or the increased emphasis on open science has given rise to new support areas for the library and information services environment. And open access or open science advocates are calling for increased transparency in research, open and timely transfer of knowledge to address global socioeconomic challenges, as well as promoting citizens' involvement in science and research. To this end, the Northwest University Library and Information Services is continuously reviewing its catalog of research services in order to keep pace with changes and demands of open science as demonstrated throughout this uh, brief presentation. Now, in 2015, the National Research Foundation um, issued an open access statement that research papers generated from research fully or partially funded by the National Research Foundation when submitting and publishing in academic journals should deposit their final peer-reviewed manuscripts that have been ac accepted by the journal to the institutional repository with an embargo period of no more than 12 months. And this statement was to be effective from the 1st of March, 2015. In addition to this, the data supporting the publication that you have published should be deposited in an accredited open access repository with the provision of a digital object identifier for future citation and referencing.
This is another statement that was um, issued by um, the National Research Foundation, and this relates to the ORCID, ORCID identifier. I will not go through it. Now, how do we respond to these uh, funder uh, statements or mandates in terms of um, open access? We have Boloka, our institutional repository, and the aim of this repository is to increase the visibility, availability, and impact of, of the research output of Northwest University. We store, we disseminate, and preserve digital scholarly material created by staff and students. The institutional repository enhances the impact of your research, a citation and edge index. It increases readership for researchers' work, and it brings forward the university's research flagship. Also preserves knowledge for future accessibility. All materials deposited on the Northwest University Boloka are subject to applicable copyright laws. So this is basically one area where we showcase our research output and um, we try to improve uh, the discoverability and the visibility of our research output, whether it's published work or it's thesis and dissertations. Then here I'm just indicating the three main open access um, uh, models. We have the gold open access, the green open access, which I would want to emphasize, and publishing in a sub subscription journal and send an accepted manuscript or postprint to Boloka. So this is one way you can uh, improve the visibility so that your work can be cited and can be discoverable um, on the World Wide Web. Once your manuscript has been accepted, you can deposit a copy with us so that we can upload it and we'll check all the copyright limitations around, around that. Then we have the hybrid open access and sub subscription journals will make your article open access only if you pay article uh, processing charges. But we also need to indicate that uh, not all OA journals require APCs. Then the second response that we have in terms of um, the NRF requirements is the uh, data repository that we call Data Yaruna, or in short, it's also commonly referred to as fiction repository. And LI, the LIS offers research data management, such as data management planning. When you are starting with your research, you need to come up with a plan to say, how are you going to deal with your data once you are done with your research? Open data dissemination of research data in open platforms, uh, data citation. And uh, in all this, in most cases, publishers of articles, journal articles, would also request you to provide them with a link where your data, your research data is kept as part of um, their publication requirements. We, it, that repository encourages the reuse of data for new research discoveries and also to meet funder requirements and as well as meet publishers requirements also enhances uh, collaboration as well as um, discoverability of raw, raw data. New research opportunities can also be discovered, reduces unintentional uh, duplication of past research because your data is already available on the World Wide uh, Web and it can be accessed. Data curation and preservation is also one of uh, uh, the services that we provide. Then, of course, the fair principles of data, that is, your data should be findable, it should be accessible, it should be interoperable, and it should be reusable. And that certainly will increase your citation rates as a researcher. 
I want to shift our attention now and talk about um, our open journal system that we have in place uh, for publishing. The LIS supports open access publishing and the dissemination of information through open access platforms. The open journal system platform is a digital platform on which these journals and any other journal that faculty members may, may be involved in uh, can be hosted. The LIS in this regard wishes to invite journal editors and members of the research community at large to make use of this free publishing platform. Then I'll talk a bit about um, ORCID, uh, connecting your uh, researchers with research. Uh, ORCID, as we all know, stands for Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. It is a unique number for identifying academic authors or contributors. And it ensures that work is properly attributed and that you receive credit for the work that you do as a researcher. And I want to ask you, is your ORCID ID populated? If not, please remember to send us an email or call on us and we'll assist you to populate your ORCID ID. Through integrations with other databases and services such as Scopus, Web of Science, Pablons, Crossref, and import from Google Scholar, your ORCID profile automatically updates all of your scholarly contributions. And these are some of uh, the key benefits of um, uh, having an ORCID that is well populated. I may not go through all of them, but um, I can say it's free and easy to set up. It encourages greater discoverability and transparent. Many funders now require that each researcher has an ORCID ID profile. Other research services offered by the LIS, reference management uh, software uh, in terms of our end node, and there could be others that are free. We also provide um, assistance with those. Enhancing your research impact in terms of journal impact factors, your citation and your H index. We also provide advice on where to publish and who to collaborate with. We also do researcher profile management. And of course, our uh, Northwest University thesis and dissertations uh, template uh, that is provided from the IT side. We also provide um, assistance with that. The international thesis and dissertations access uh, through ProQuest, we also provide that service. And of course, advanced information and data literacy programs. We also have research commons infrastructure across our campuses. And I think on this note, I really need to thank the university executive for the support that they have given us. Um, we started on this route from about 2014. And I can tell you today that uh, in terms of research commons, we have three out of three, that is one on each campus. And uh, just recently, I think about three weeks ago, we were also opening a similar facility for our undergraduate students um, in, in Mahiken so that we can motivate them to do well so that they can join the postgraduate level of studies and become researchers. Before I conclude my short presentation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to respond or just highlight some of the issues that uh, Prof. Nenes also indicated in her presentation. Uh, in terms of how to access uh, Science Direct and other databases when you are off campus, because when you are on campus, um, it, you will never be asked uh, to uh, log in it's just automatically, you are authenticated automatically. But once you are off campus, you are using your own network. You then need to authenticate. 
And for you to be able to authenticate, a prompt will pop up once you click on Science Director or any other database that you need to capture in your surname and your ID or your university number, whether it's a student number or a staff number. Then once you have done that, you will be allowed access to all the resources that we have online. And uh, like uh, uh, Prof. Duplessy has said, we are emphasizing a lot more on our visual library or the online library because of the uh, current pandemic. And we have a lot of information resources available on this online library. In fact, in terms of our budget expenditure, we actually spend millions of friends just to support our researchers in terms of uh, their resource needs. Then in terms of uh, the open access policy, which uh, Prof. Nenesi also uh, mentioned, we are almost ready. Um, we have a draft already that will be shared with the relevant committees um, from April uh, going up and hopefully before the end of the year, we will have an approved open access policy. Right, uh, in terms of our um, contact um, details, as I conclude this short presentation, I think I have uh, put up here uh, the members of staff that you can contact. Um, we have Mr. Tiani Mabunda, uh, who was recently appointed as director for Open Scholarship Services and is based in Mahiken, and there is his email. We also have Mrs. Nontoweko Makalela, uh, who is librarian research support, and there is their email address. We also, and um, Nontoweko is based in Porchester. We also have Miss, Mr. Malusi Langa, uh, his librarian research support, based on the Fandabeo Park campus. Or alternatively, you can just contact your faculty librarian. Um, this is where I end it, and back to you, Chair. session on uh, uh, research and innovation support by the library information services. For the sake of time, let's quickly move over to Dr. Janine, who is going to talk to us on uh, technology transfer and information support. Innovation support, I'm sorry. Over to you, Dr. Janine. Okay. All right. So thank you for the opportunity. Today I'd like to share with you what the Tech Transfer Office uh, and Innovation Support Office does by way of three examples. However, I'd like to start off with um, looking at some definitions and the technology transfer process. Okay. So what is technology transfer? It is the process of transferring scientific findings from one organization to another, for the purpose of further development and commercialization. So through knowledge creation and academic research, our researchers, including academic staff and higher degree students, from time to time come up with solutions which address a particular industrial, commercial, or social need. And then it is the tech transfer office who is the um, bridge to transfer that knowledge, research output, technology, or intellectual property, as the case may be, from the university to an external organization. So then what is innovation? Now, if you ask Google for a definition of innovation, you'll get something like 700 million results with thousands of definitions. So every expert um, seems to have their own views on what innovation is, and it's really become an overused term. So perhaps it is more useful to not look for a singular definition because it will vary based on circumstance, but to find one that works for us. So while the university doesn't have an agreed definition of, innov of innovation, I quite like to use this one. And I like it because it incorporates having an idea, but more than that, executing an idea 
in order to address a specific and very real challenge. And then um, that idea or that innov innovation actually achieves value for both the company. Um, in other words, the organization that is producing or distributing, disseminating the innovation and the customer who is using the innovation. So if we look at the tech transfer process, on the left, where on the left we will really begin with the idea, and we'll end up on the right with the innovation. But it really starts with this knowledge creation and the idea, or the you know potential solution that the researchers come up with, and this needs to be disclosed to our office. We will then do an assessment on whether to proceed with that opportunity, and then there are a lot of activities involved from that point onwards like fundraising for tech development, IP protection, marketing, and ultimately we want to get to an IP transaction or a license, for example, either to an existing company or to a startup company, who will then do further product development and commercialization and ultimately, ultimately lead to impact. So I've chosen three examples, as I said, to illustrate um, the process and, and the different steps along the way. The first is from the Faculty of Health Sciences um, and the Wartels. Um, it's a very colorful and attention grabbing math, maths board game for primary school learners and pre-primary and primary school uh, learners. Um, in fact, it's, it's really more than a board game as we know it. It has many components, including a number of different board game activities, storytelling and puppets. So the unique selling point of this is um, that it improves children's math achievement by focusing on both cognitive and psychological factors. So when used by therapists um, and psychologists, teachers, parents, it includes the principles of play therapy to optimize learning and understanding of math. It was developed by Dr. Pietro Erasmus and the TTIS offers secured C funding for her to develop the Wartels concept into a final product. Development was done working closely with Mind Music, who went on to become the, um, the licensee. So working with an industry partner is something that we wholeheartedly encourage and we try to do and set up as far as possible, because this really greatly increases the chances of commercialization success. The Mind Music has experience in developing educational products. They have expertise on the manufacturability of the different components, um, but very importantly, they have an existing uh, customer base and they also have marketing capabilities. So our office um, supports um, Dr. Erasmus as she seeks funding for further developing the Wattles uh, into an app and also with the marketing that she does. So last we also have been negotiated and, con and concluded the license and will continue to monitor and manage the license. The underlying intellectual property in this uh, board game is, is copyright in the, you know, in the layout of the game and the text. And we also filed a trademark on the wild tools. The next example is from the Faculty of um, Engineering. And I hope that you have already heard about it. This is the, the Chop Chop app. It's a health screening app that easily collects and stores individual information, health information. It was developed by Professor Leonta Kropla and Dr. Henry Marais um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, initially for schools. So this app stores data in the cloud and it relays a summary to a central monitoring point. Um, this could be a principal of a school or the, um, the manager of a business. But really, any type of organization that has a large number of people crossing its premises would find this um, app useful. Um, because it saves time and effort at the screening station. So the underlying intellectual property is the copyright in the software, and we also filed a, um, a trademark for the name Chop Chop. We did a lot of marketing to commercialize the app and to find and grow the customer base. Um, so both Dr. Erasmus from the previous example of Wattles and Professor Hrobloch are extremely active uh, marketeers and this type of involvement of the researchers in the technology transfer process is really a huge positive difference um, to, to successful commercialization. Um, the app is being commercialized internally while we prove the business model 
for a potential spin-up or startup company. In other words, we aim to show that the business is able to grow and generate sufficient revenues to sustain, to sustain itself in the longer term. The tech and innovation support office also helps our university spin out companies to seek investment or um, venture capital funding. Our third example is metal tellurium oxides from the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. So these metal tellurium oxides are novel light ch chargeable catalyst material and they exhibit sustained and enhanced activity after light excitation has ended. This means that the obvious application is in photovoltaics. Um, this technology comes out of the uh, research group of Professor Quivers Crick. We have filed two separate patent applications for the technology. Um, it is still in the pre-commercialization stage. It's still very early. We helped secure some planning for him to develop an early prototype, um, but we have high hopes for his commercialization potential. So I hope colleagues that through these three examples, I've given you a flavor of some of the innovative research that is taking place at Northwest University and the commercialization opportunities that our office is pursuing, as well as the expert services that we offer to the university and, and to our researchers. I've also just briefly touched on intellectual property, but our office does give regular presentations or webinars um, about IP or tech plants and commercialization in general, either for the wider university community or targeted for smaller research groups or departments. And then just to end off on th this presentation, I'd like to just take you through some key points of our intellectual property policy at Northwest University. So firstly, intellectual property created in the course and scope of staff's employment or student's registration at the university is owned by the university. Then our staff and students must disclose potentially protectable commercializable IP to our office before sharing it publicly. That means before releasing it as a thesis or dissertation or publishing it in a scientific journal or presenting it at conferences. Um, our IP creators will benefit from the commercialization of this um, of their intellectual property. So we will share our licensing income with the IP creators. It is also important to seek prior institutional approval, approval on all arrangements regarding IP with an external party, be that a collaborator, industry partner, funder, etc. And we are available to advise on those matters. Should you need to share confidential information relating to your research to an external party. You should seek advice from us in putting together a non-disclosure agreement, also known as a confidentiality agreement. Likewise, should material need to be shared between organizations and a material transfer agreement needs to put in place and we can help with that as well. Nowadays, material is increasingly, um, increasingly includes data. And then lastly, only duly authorized signatories can sign agreements. So if you have any questions um, about your IP, about your you know, innovation, I think the first point of contact is your deputy dean for research and innovation within your faculty. Um, of course, the, the technical transfer and innovation support team is available. I've listed here the names of some of our key um, team members for you know, intellectual property and contracts, Johan Kutzia, for general innovation and commercialization, Hannes Malan, and then we have three commercialization specialists, Mithilin uh, Banjwa, Keta Reng Palori, and FR Pazanonet. We're also upgrading our webpage to, to provide more relevant and interesting up-to-date information um, and reading material on you know, topics like intellectual property. But of course, you're all welcome to contact me. Um, that's my email address and phone number. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Janine. Um, much appreciated. And I see some of the comments in the chat box is, is appreciation for what your office is doing. And I can just only also add my voice to that. Then we move on to our next presenter, Ms. Bibi Bowman. And she is uh, from sustainability and impact department and as we all know these days when you apply for a grant uh, one of the most important questions is what impact on the community will this have so we are looking forward to your presentation thank you Bibi. Uh, thank you chair and uh, all protocol uh, reserved we're very very excited to share our presentation with you I'm going to move forward. Um, an engaged university is really important, and you will see that the elements of an engaged university includes teaching, research, and outreach. And there are elements of overlaps between all of these activities. And engaged research is between the outreach and the uh, research, but it can also include uh, teaching elements. If we see that, this is a more complex figure, and that will be available in the support guidelines for community engagement on the web, uh, where we have overlap with all the ways of, uh, of interaction and engagement. In the middle, if we can get everything uh, uh, working towards uh, proper engagement, we will uh, achieve scholarship of engagement. I'm not going to elaborate right on this but we do agree that forms of engagement can also include knowledge transfer and uh, sharing of expertise but it is not just simply outreach it's about including um, your your uh, activities to benefit the, the, the uh, broader community for social good and therefore uh, we wish to ensure that this is integrated into the core business of the university so we contribute to the goal three of uh, the IPP of the university and those objectives include graduate attributes, support and collaboration with communities for mutual benefit. So it's not just the benefit of the community. You're not doing things to and for communities. You're doing things with communities. Uh, all activities must uh, have that element of mutual benefit. Uh, we want to promote the scholarship engagement through outreach sharing of expertise teaching and learning and research engaged research particularly and then uh, part of our unit as, is also to promote in, uh, environmental sustainability uh, and then reporting and impact measurement on those activities so how do we achieve the twin goals of academic excellence and commitment to social justice which is the part uh, where we link into community engagement by doing engaged research and the building Building box is the same as any kinds of research that we would do uh, based on excellence, visibility, but with keeping impact in mind and making sure that you're doing research that is relevant to not uh, only a specific grouping and not only relevant to the university. So if we look at the data that we have available currently, uh, and we have, we'll put this banner on our web page as well. Uh, in 2019, uh, the impact of the university it was very interesting in terms of that we had 335 activities uh, with 12 contributing entities and our engagement pro uh, profile showed that in engaged research, 25% of our work was uh, focused on engaged research and it contributed to 516 types of impacts. These included consumer well-being, being, spiritual well-being, family and home well-being, political well-being, basic needs, safety, environmental well-being, etc. And that is also available on, 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 on this profile. Now, considering that we had COVID in 2020, it was very interesting to see a shift towards more sharing of expertise because obviously we couldn't go into communities and work face to face with our communities. And although there's a reduction, there is still a strong contribution to how we interact with our communities in terms of outreach, which was uh, clearly um, uh, necessary in the circumstances, and then uh, engaged teaching and learning as well as engaged research. Now, of the total number of engaged activities that uh, 
took place in 2020, you will see that our faculty of economics and management sciences were the most active uh, of the 105 uh, reported activities. We have uh, them contributing, considering to this, followed by faculty of education, natural sciences and health sciences. And you will see, obviously, the students also made a contribution despite the fact that they couldn't really go into communities uh, as they normally do in terms of outreach, which is really encouraging considering the, uh, the circumstances. Uh, what we also acknowledge is that certain faculties do lend themselves more to engagement, but it is not exclusively only for certain grouping. And as this is the third pillar of uh, the university core business, it is not just focusing on outreach, but going beyond this and integrating this into your engaged research. So we have a support plan from our unit, which is to develop the consciousness and responsiveness to students by providing um, advocacy in many fields, providing training in terms of how you do engage research. We have a toolkit for uh, assessing uh, your community development processes. We are creating an enabling environment uh, that provide uh, relevant training by uh, opportunities for, for, for staff. And also we facilitate partnerships with the various external parties that come to us with particular needs that they want to uh, have addressed. We also enhance the knowledge sharing by uh, communicating information to communities and communicating uh, needs uh, that get communi uh, communicated back to our uh, research entities and our faculties that are the owners of uh, engaged research in faculty. Uh, we have a faculty uh, community engagement uh, uh, board with a deputy dean that takes ownership and uh, uh, takes care of uh, community engagement and we support them by a policy clarification identification of opportunities for research and funding uh, opportunities although we do not do fundraising or have funding available for community engagement in our unit that must be provided and planned for within faculties um, we also support the commercialization of expertise with the TTIS group in terms of contributing to linking con external constituents to the expertise within faculties in especially multi and transdisciplinary interventions and sharing that knowledge uh, to and fro, especially if a community comes to us with a particular problem, for example, saying that we don't have water, we don't have enough water, or we have to send in experts available from the university that can then uh, determine what the problem is um, and then find a collaboration between uh, many stakeholders in order to find a solution to such a problem. So we have community engagement and community engagement research courses through the Knowledge for Change Hub, which I will elaborate on a little bit and we create a culture of environmental stewardship among students through awareness campaigns, working closely with um, uh, facilities and facility management in order to become a greener university. And you will see some really interesting things developing in the future in this space. Uh, we also provide input into an integrated report from the university, uh, which is uh, including the social and environmental responsibility of the university, and then we have a very strong link with the South African Higher Education Community Forum, which is a national forum for 26 universities, and you can see the uh, website there, and uh, a lot of the uh, training and uh, collaboration also happens in this space. Um, we are also planning writing retreats specifically in writing community engagement articles in this particular forum. Then there's additional support from the unit uh, in terms of linking external stakeholders with the internal expertise. We do the planning and execution of impact studies and we support uh, and provide data for needs assessments. We do, uh, do uh, training in terms of the methodologies that can be used to include external parties in research. And we also are in, involved in the facilitation of the de de democratization of knowledge sharing, uh, because we have realized that 
that knowledge is not only generated by the, uh, the university itself, although it uh, sees itself as a custodian of knowledge, and knowledge generation and sharing uh, should be expanded and beyond the border of the university. As part of that, we have also become part of a uh, European Union funded project, which is called the Common Good First Project. It is a digital story lab uh, that was created and in, in this platform. We uh, then upload stories of uh, community members that have made use of social entrepreneurship methodologies where they find solutions in their own communities with their own resources and they share this internationally. Um, then I will now speak to the Knowledge for Change Hub. The Knowledge for Change Hub was launched in November of 2020 and there are two parts to this hub, a southern and a northern part of the hub. We are part of the northern part of the hub in collaboration with the University of Free State, but this is an international initiative uh, where uh, the UNESCO Chair for uh, Educational and Scientific and Cultural Organizations are part of this uh, and also the University of Victoria and Priya in India. Uh, there is a strong link to the Faculty of Education at the moment where the Combo Research Niche is working and has designed a short learning program uh, where academics and NGO leaders can then work together on community-based research. It can be online or face-to-face -face, and they make use of the principles of ethical community-based research. Um, there's custom designed workshops that can be done and there is also some short videos in terms of the methodologies that can be used in this space. So the Knowledge for Change Hubs will train the next generation of mentors and leaders in community-based research and the idea is also to include the community partners in sometimes doing research on our behalf. Um, now this is a new way of thinking and it is about the decolonization of the curriculum, the decolonization of the thinking of engagement in terms of how we become more exclusive and remove some of the structural impediments that we currently have in terms of engaged research. So uh, we are also very strongly um, uh, linking engaged research to relevant needs and that can be found uh, very broadly in the sustainable development goals which we need to report on as a university. Uh, we want to also advance the agenda of community-based research within in institutions through this hub and support researchers in finding funding and doing conducting more uh, engaged research. So, uh, as I've mentioned, there's a Free State uh, Norfolk University collaboration in the northern part of the hub. The southern part of the hub is uh, constituted currently with uh, Durban University of Technology and Rhodes and um, uh, Nelson Mandela is also interested in coming on board. Um, we have four trained mentor mentors at the moment that are uh, training community-based partners. We've got a short learning program, as mentioned before, and there will be various workshops presented specifically on community-based research. And this will be co coordinated by our office, which is called Sustainability and Community Impact. Now, this is uh, the, the content of the course, which will be presented by Professor Leslie Wood on the foundation of and principles of this, uh, the forming of sustainable research partnerships, how to conduct the research, and also utilizing digital technologies in the space. So, this is my very short presentation. I thank you very much for this. Please check out our new and improved website, which includes the new, newly uh, uh, updated policy for community engagement and uh, also uh, content in terms of the staff in our unit. And uh, kindly look out for our invitation for the Community Engagement Award Ceremony, which will be a virtual ceremony taking place on the 31st of March at 11 o'clock. Currently, you can contact myself or Dr. Henry Kutsia, who is our manager for community engagement. Thank you very much, uh, our research engagements. Uh, thank you very much, Bibi. Um, I do not see any open questions in the Q&A section currently, uh, but I see a lot of information that um, uh, 
you can find there. So this saves us a little bit of time and put us back on track. Um, so I uh, hand over to my co-director to continue to the next speaker, please. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Jenny. Uh, colleagues, uh, I think we are almost on track based on time. So now is my opportunity to introduce to you uh, Dr. Shemis Subramani. Uh, she is focusing on research and innovation support within the Global Engagement Department. Over to you, Dr. Shemis. Thank you, Prof. Washington. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Today I'll be discussing the role of global engagement. Um, I am Dr. Shanice Subramani and I'm the director. So global engagement for office, office functions to support and facilitate internationalization activities at the Northwest University, whilst demonstrating excellence, equity and innovation in the pursuit of internationalization and promoting a culture of global awareness and appreciation for international perspectives and cultural diversity at the NWU. So in order to simplify an overview of our activities for the purpose of today's forum, I'll divide my presentation broadly into two sections, namely support for international students and support for international partnerships and collaboration. So first I'll talk about international student support. So global engagement contributes towards providing an environment, environment for international students that embraces and celebrates diversity. We monitor international internationalization innovations, current practices and future trends in order to harness and develop best practice with regard to international students. This is critical in order to ensure that we constantly have good service delivery for our international students. So one of the Global Engagement Office's primary functions is to serve as an immigration office and ensure compliance with South Africa Department of Home Affairs immigration legislation. To this end, our office and its staff members have to comply with the Immigration Act as an institution. So learning institutions have to comply with the following rules and the NWU needs to adhere to these. Uh, this is an uh, outline of the obligation of our foreign students. So at the office, there's implementation of key internal controls relating to international student operations in order to conform to the immigration rules and regulations. So we have constant liaison with the DHA regarding uh, legislation and compliance. We provide a logistical support service that enables and empowers international students, and we provide advice and support for new and returning international students. So general inquiries from prospective and returning students and specialized advice on applications for study permits. This is a general overview of our processes and procedures. A sign off of all international students. So all our students must first report to the international office and pending verification of passports, study permits, medical aid, proof of vaccinations, the radiological report, medical report, and all other supporting documentation. We have liaison with embassies, consulates, high commissions in South Africa and abroad concerning visa applications and study permits. Uh, we maintain uh, complete international student files with all requisite documents in a confidential manner for inspection by DHA. And we also maintain a database of international students for biannual reporting purposes to the DHA. We also provide practical and emotional support for all our international students. What we cannot do is provide an intervention or contact government or visa officers requesting that they speed up an application or find out the status of a current application. This is a private and legal process between the student and the respective office over which we have no jurisdiction or control. So this is a list of our offices at the three campuses and the names of our offices and the presentation will be available, but our names are also on the website. So this is basically our international student process. 
So pre-arrival, once an international student has successfully applied to the Northwest University, they need to contact our office. Then they will be issued with an invitation letter, which they will need to apply for a study permit. The office will also send other necessary forms and attachments com for completion. We also assist asylum seekers and refugee permit holders. So it's preferable for all documents to be submitted collectively in a single email as follows, and with the subject field uh, listing the student number, year of registration, level and campus, and color can scan copies of the passport, visa, green-eyed book if a non-citizen, proof of medical insurance, which is only waived for permanent resident uh, permits, um, proof of vaccinations for MMR and meningitis, and if applicable, yellow fever. And please note that vaccinations are not uh, in contravention of anybody's human rights. It's also compulsory that all required documents are submitted to the Global Engagement Office electronically prior to depart departure. And on the day of arrival, all these documents need to be presented at the office. We also send a checklist out to all our international students so that they are aware of the documentation that they need. And we also encourage them to make copies of all documents submitted to the embassy. And this is a checklist that goes out to the students. And then once students arrived, they must report with all their documents. They need a sign-off form before they can proceed to registration. And the sign-off form can only be obtained at our office. Okay, and these are a list of, of the documents that need to be presented when the student arrives. Students are directed to the relevant departments for any support that they require. We also issue letters so that students may open bank accounts, cell phone accounts, letters for the traffic department, etc. Students requiring accommodation are directed to Bookkeeper Blaif, and if they require airport transfers, we put them in contact with various transfer services. Okay, so global engagement further support, uh, serves to support and facilitate international partnerships partnerships and collaboration activities, as well as other internationalization initiatives at the institutions. We aim to ex uh, expand and in intensify Northwest University strategic partnerships with prominent international institutions of higher learning, including the possibility of joint and or double degrees, academic and or support staff and or student exchange programs and or research collaborations. We monitor internationalization innovations, current practices and future trends in order to harness and develop best practice with regard to international partnerships and collaboration. We provide support for faculties in the internationalization activities. We also maintain a database of partnerships, agreements and memorandum of understanding or agreements for consultative and reporting purposes. So um, we provide facilitation of international partnerships and advice to all our internal stakeholders on the partnership process. So when contacted by an academic or school of faculty, we identify whether the current partnership exists with the intended institution, or if not, then our colleague is guided through the process, the relevant partnership template is provided, or the in partner institution template is used. Uh, the relevant supporting documents must be obtained from the executive dean. All supporting documents must then be submitted to legal services for approval. And finally, the documents are submitted to the relevant signatory. We also provide assistance for all internal stakeholders in, in order that proper protocol and etiquette are ensured and observed for visiting international delegations and to ensure that visits for international visitors are strategically prepared. So colleagues, if you have an international delegation visiting and you're unsure about the protocols to be observed, please contact us and we will assist. Um, we also have act active part participation with a number of local and international professional bodies of which I'm the contact person. So for example, with AISA, uh, SANOD and SARUA. And then we forward all collaboration activities to research support for distribution to colleagues and students. 
We also have liaison with various external stakeholders for various opportunities, liaison with the international officers of other tertiary institutions in South Africa for best, uh, best practice and benchmarking, liaison with partner universities in order to provide information and opportunities for study abroad, abroad programs for our students. And we also attend many of the relevant uh, functions with our external stakeholders, such as embassies and government institutions with an aim to increasing internationalization. Colleagues, uh, I want to just touch upon a very important workshop that we host at the university. So we host an annual intercultural communication workshop. And colleagues, when we look at the scope of our university's international footprint, which is extensive indeed, and which the following maps will display, it shows the need uh, for such workshops. So if we look at our international student distribution, um, you can see the countries are, uh, have purple color. You will see that we, uh, in 2019, we have students from over 60 countries. And if you look at our international partnership distribution for 2020, you can look at the reach of our international collaborations. And so, we see the need for intercultural communication workshops. And these workshops are offered annually by international experts in the field. And the workshop content, content varies from year to year, depending on the needs. Our academic and support staff are welcome to attend. And the invitation is also extended to our postdoctoral fellows. The workshops are held on all campuses by leading international facilitator to build a high level of cross-cultural sensitivity. And these workshops cover a range of topics of importance to academics and support staff who are interested in multicultural education and intercultural communication. The workshops focus on a practical approach to communication in an intercultural context and aim to develop intercultural awareness and skills, enable participants to work effectively with people from different cultures. So developing intercultural training leads to an inter increased knowledge of cultural intelligence and competence in educational environments. So in conclusion, Global engagement continues to develop an international profile for global excellence and stature by providing a positive, exploitation-free, and non-discriminatory environment for the international community. Thank you. Dr. Shanice, thank you very much for, for this very enlightening presentation. Um, uh, I think we all know where to go when we, we're in need of help. Um, if there's any questions, colleagues, please type it in the question and answer box for Dr. Shanice or any of the other speakers, they will attend to that. I would like to misuse the opportunity of having my mic open to welcome Prof. Dan. Uh, I saw that our VC joined us earlier. Um, we are so happy to have you with us. And um, we are hereby also assured of the support of, of yourself for research at the NWU. So we hope that you are going to enjoy this uh, forum with us. Uh, next, we have Dr. Yanni Jacobs, and he is going to talk about quality enhancement in research and higher degrees. Thank you, Dr. Yanni. Vice Chancellor, Acting DVC Research and Innovation Program Directors and colleagues and students. I want to start off by acknowledging the different sources that I consulted in preparation of this brief overview. Over the last few years, we can trace literature across the higher education sector with a growing emphasis on the explicit enhancement of quality. This is associated perhaps with the growth in the last two decades of a sense of shared confidence about the higher education sector's ability to assure quality and standards effectively. With regard to the standards, I want to remind you of the so-called doctoral standard with its clear graduate attributes. More about this later. 
Within universities and other types of research institutions, the enhancement of learning, teaching and research have often been assumed to be an implicit part of the work of individual teachers and or researchers, but appears to be increasingly the subject of explicit discourse. And those of you who were involved with the doctoral review report will remember that this is in fact what happened. In many cases, structures and processes to support quality enhancement are receiving more attention than in the past. The balance between those institutional resources directed to assurance and those to enhancement is being adjusted. Assurance is one thing, but enhancement is another, perhaps two sides of the same coin. There are also signs of this change in institutional learning, teaching and research and the associated educational strategies, which appear to make more specific reference to enhancement and yet indicates its link with quality assurance. Quality enhancement as a concept and its relationship to quality assurance appear to be understood in a number of different ways. For example, in some cases, the relationship may be conceived of as hierarchical, meaning assurance of quality is seen as a necessary component of effective enhancement or vice versa. In others, the two are mutually reinforcing, but still parallel concepts. When we start to look closer to, at ourselves as a institution, we noticed from the doctoral review and the master's degrees that have been reviewed that, that these higher degrees that are standalone and not affiliated with or linked to any research entity in an overt way are at least to some extent marginalized. Previous speakers also alluded to this. Very interesting that I also picked it up. A link with entities may enhance the sustainability of the scientific reputation of existing entities. Flowing from this, perhaps the most crucial participant in the higher degrees process, namely the applicant, who goes through quite a few evolutionary phases when he or she becomes a candidate a student, a graduate, and eventually an alumni. Obtaining assurance during each phase, these phases that I've just referred to, relies heavily on capturing the appropriate data at the right time. This, in order to act proactively to identify areas in need of attention or improvement, and that may even embed areas of risk. Once risks have been identified, obviously these can be mitigated. One such area is ownership. It's easy to say that the faculty owns a specific higher degree, but it's another when deficiencies and areas of risk are to be attended to. I will not go into the detail there. One very broad concern and it was also identified in the doctoral review report, is the absence of clear, measurable, and documented milestones that are captured on a university system with easy access to it by directors and strategic intelligence to name but two, from which it can be deduced which students are at risk of dropping out. This issue I've also discussed with the uh, recently established uh, unit in Prof. Nenezi's office who will support higher degrees. Another challenge we still face is carefully attending to the assessment, measurement, and or examination of the graduate attributes as documented in the doctoral standard. Our current examination templates, at least for the doctoral degrees, are just not sufficiently covering all the attributes. Maybe I could also say the examination templates do not have to cover all the attributes, but 
then the question remains, how do we assure that the respective attributes are demonstrated and captured appropriately with the correct evidence? Perhaps more debate is to be engaged with once we have received the doctoral review report from the Council on Higher Education. Despite the current challenges that we all find ourselves in, we have much to talk about, but we also have much to do as we all find ourselves locked into the cycle of never ending improvement. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yami. I think you addressed a very important question, like uh, what is the quality enhancement regarding research and higher degrees? And then in our case, maybe what I've just picked from what you said is, it is an enhancement of the individual researcher. In this case, this can be a student or a staff member, as well as the augmentation or improvement of the researcher's attributes, knowledge, ability, skills, and potential. And this you didn't elaborate on some of the things, but I think it was quite an interesting presentation, those shots. And then we can maybe discuss if there are issues in the discussion session. At this time, colleagues, I have the opportunity to introduce you Mr. Sheikh Scott, who is going to talk to us about information technology support. Over to you, Mr. Sheikh. Thank you, Program Director. Good morning, uh, colleagues and uh, participants. Uh, the role of IT in support of uh, research and innovation. Uh, IT has been involved in supporting uh, research and innovation for a couple of years called the e-research. Now in this regard, IT's vision uh, is to collaboratively facilitate the training and adoption of cutting edge e-research practices and to act as a catalyst for new practices that will accelerate, broaden and emphasize the impact of research conducted at the Northwest University nationally and internationally. Such a vision can be achieved through the provisioning of systems support, integration, staff and students training, sustainability, community inclusion, and awareness. There are various benefits uh, to this approach, uh, which results into the provisioning and support of research data management, the provisioning of IT platforms to support computational and digital research. The approach further leads uh, to the support of practices such as open science practices, the use of reproducible uh, research standards, the amalgamation of these approaches and practices offers the Northwest University community with various platforms to support research collaboration, interdisciplinary and extradisciplinary, nationally and internationally, and thereby lead to improved funding opportunities to support research through such established uh, collaborations. Now, where does IT fit within the research and innovation space and its role players? As you can see uh, from the screen, IT is located as a strategic partner and an enabler uh, between the library and the research office in conjunction with academic faculties and departments. So in that arrangement, IT provides the needed or required technocratic expertise and cutting edge systems for the success of the e-research initiative, initiatives. This is done by ensuring maximum uptime systems availability directly on site and or remotely or ubiquitously. Now, 
IT therefore provides a number of basic IT enablers uh, to support research and innovation uh, at the Northwest University, which are listed in the screen, but they are not limited to that. Uh, we do provide network connectivity or LAN uh, that you get in your office, or in your laboratories, your Wi-Fi, your data for remote uh, work. Access platforms, for example, your online collaboration tools, which we are now using the Zooms and your Teams, uh, library systems, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Moyo, Fix share info ed for the research office, your email for communications. Computing environments, for example, your computer laboratories for students, your storage environments, for example, cloud services like Nextcloud, uh, Google Drive for students, uh, Microsoft OneDrive for both staff and students. We also offer websites, your emailing list, your library reports, etc. That is all I had for this session, program director. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shanks. Your connection was a bit poor, and then we struggled to hear you a bit, but then at least there were some slides there which would follow. And then now I don't know what happened because I think uh, the technical colleagues were trying to help you with the connection and we've lost some questions. But as I went through the questions, there was one which maybe we need to address. First was uh, from global engagement. There, was, there were quite a lot of words of appreciation for the good work they're doing, but there was a comment regarding postdocs. I, the question was saying postdocs are neither taken as staff members nor as senior students. They seem to be in between. So is there a way in which global engagement can come in to try and elaborate on this, uh, what will I call it, a misunderstanding some sort of. So I'm trying to rephrase the questions I've got. So maybe, do you have some response there, uh, Dr. Shelis? Oh, thank you, Prof. Washington. I'm not sure I'm the right person. We have tried in the past um, to have the conversation because we know postdoctoral fellows are not really students. But I think this is uh, probably should be addressed in a different forum. Thank you. Thank you. And then the second question, which I got before it disappeared, was talking to the preparation of uh, visiting professors from NWU as they go international. The question was, whom do we go for assistance in such a case? Maybe it's a sabbatical or something like that, going international. Does global engagement help in any way in such a case? That was the second question. We can help, but as in the way we help our professors visiting our institution, usually the best person then to contact is the international office uh, at the institution where our academic is going. So if they contact me, I can assist them and put them in touch with the director of the, the office at the university that they will be visiting. And then we can go from there. Oh, the, the question is here, it's from Ross. It's saying it is for professors visiting NWU for sabbatical and not the other way around. Oh, okay, yes, we, we do provide certain support. I have sent Rose a, an email so she can contact me after she reads my response. Okay, thank you so much, colleagues. Yes. Thank you, Prof. Washington. Thank you, colleagues. I think we have about uh, seven minutes or so. Any further questions before we move to the next slot? for the presentations of uh, Dr. Yami, Mr. Shakes, as well as Dr. Shanice. Any questions? Uh, it seems we don't have questions, colleagues. So if you do not mind, can I hand over to my co-chair? Over to you, Prof. Janeta. Thank you, Prof. Washington. Um, I would like to ask Prof. Nanesi to 
project this slide uh, with regards to the support for postgraduate students. Now, Prof. Nenezi, I'm not sure if you received that yet, please. Well, uh, Prof. Janetta, I have not yet received the slide. Uh, I just communicated earlier on with the colleagues from CTL, but it uh, looks like I'm checking again quickly on my email. Um, it's not here yet, but what I would do then when uh, we send out the when we send out the link to the video for this forum, uh, I we will also include the invitation to the postgraduate launch. But what they have just confirmed to me now is uh, the fact that because next week, most people will be busy traveling, it will be in the first two weeks of April. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Nenesi. Um, colleagues, this then brings us to the closing remarks and the vote of thanks. So I would like to hand over to Prof. Dan Kwadi, please. Hey, colleagues, uh, good, good morning. Morning, colleagues. I think uh, this is really exciting. I've been part of this. Uh, I joined in a little bit later. But I really, really, I'm so excited about this fora, forum. It's just one of the beginnings of all many fora that will follow from, from risk. Because uh, listening to it is so informative. And I can imagine if I'm in the community of researchers, at least it will bring me as part of the community. It is important to really keep researchers as a community so that no one feels alone out there and no one wonders where to get what in terms of the support that we can provide. I mean, I listen to the library explaining how they provide support in IT, how it also provides support. I think it is it's really important because yes, and for new researchers and also those that come from outside joining us, it will work, it will come out quite handy. Well, Vandals, I must really, really thank you for this. And uh, I think uh, as we go on, as we move on, it, it, it really create a sense of community for of, of researchers. As I've said, to, to feel alone in this is not, is not good. And especially in this very trying times, in these trying times of Corona, it is, it is possible that one can feel alone there and, and not as not, not as part of, of, of the collective. I must also in the same note, colleagues, thank you very much for your contribution to the research output. You know, from this very difficult period that we've been through, but uh, we saw how you kept the, the, the light burning so that nothing was abandoned. We still continued to do our bit. And I think we are also counted others out there. Thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you very much, Prof. Dan. Um, colleagues, I would like to thank all the panelists um, uh, for their presentations. I would like prof to thank Prof. Franz and Prof. Nanesi for, for their part. And um, uh, thank you so much to everybody who attended and to New Sound Productions who helped us through this. Um, there were some novices between us, including myself, um, but, but thank you that you, you had a lot of, um, uh, how can I say, adult with us, <laughs> patience. You had a lot of patience with us and um, I think this is really informative and it would really help the researchers on the way. I don't know if Prof. Franz would like to say the last word. Maybe. No, Dr. Uh, 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 Prof. Janet, Prof. France had to, to dash out now quickly. And uh, he has uh, conveyed his appreciation 
of uh, the contributions that were done today. And also to say thank you to the Vice Chancellor for making time. It was an honor having him here. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Nanesi. Colleagues, thank you for attending. That brings us to the end of this forum then. Thank you. Bye-bye.